This is Global Mining News. Welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli. And there's almost too much to talk about. I was digging deeper into the Rio Tinto story, and I can't say I loved what I saw. I'll share it with you shortly in the news section. Uh, You can make your own mind up with that. Mildly shocking, maybe for me, maybe it was obvious from hearing the story last week and it all made sense to you what was going on. Call me naive. So we're going to take a look at that. In our news section, once again, we're going to reopen with Rio Tinto blowing up the 46,000-year-old Aboriginal site. Kind of mind-boggling in this intensely ESG-focused landscape. However, first and foremost, we have the Canadian Mining Symposium starts today. It starts today. And so there's lots to look forward to. I think you can still register if you haven't yet. I mean, there's a register button there. So I think we have as many as 1,600 people. Uh, It's really uh, pretty awesome uh, what they've done. So congratulations to all the team. So far, let's see if we can all pull it off now. Congratulations for getting us this far. (laughs) Let's say that. We'll save the real celebrations for after. Um, But yeah, I have an interview at 2.10 Eastern Standard Time, and that is with Gord Stothart of I Am Gold. And I think probably the first question I'm going to ask him is, how do you pronounce I Am Gold? It should be Yam Gold. And so if you want to find out about that, tune in at 2.10, but don't miss actually the beginning. I believe it starts at 10 o'clock. Anthony Vaccaro, Northern Miner Group publisher, will be giving a speech to open up the procession. I think our friend Dean from the TSX, Dean McPherson, a great guy who was, I believe, at the last two, maybe even three Canadian mining symposiums. He will also give some opening remarks at 10.15, Then at 10.30, we have the SRK Thought Leadership Panel. And, I mean, we have people from the World Bank, SRK Consulting, Sentara Gold. And so that's pretty cool. And then Nakia is involved. I love how they're broadening the sponsorships to places like Nakia. So, Nakia, welcome to the Northern Miner Canadian Mining Symposium. And there is... A small talk by Nakia Strategic Marketing Director, Mark Jadul, at 11.15 Eastern. So that should be interesting. You wonder what he'll say. And then at 11.30, we have Group 10 Metals Investor Presentation. And then another panel. This is moderated by Cecilia Jamasmi from Mining.com. She's Senior Editor. And the panel is called Going Back to First Principles in Geology and Business, and it features Ashley Kerwin, who is president and CEO and principal geologist at Oryx Geoscience. And then we have, at 1 o'clock, we have an executive fireside chat with Sean Boyd, Agnico Eagle, vice chairman and CEO, and he is interviewed by Anthony Vaccaro. Then we have a Can Alaska investor presentation, And then some remarks from Pear Tree uh, CEO, Lisa Davis, at 2 o'clock. And then it's followed by me, Adrian Pocabelli, interviewing Gord Stothart, president and CEO of I Am Gold, for an executive fireside chat. And finally, at 2.55 p.m., we have closing remarks. And that is only day one, ladies and gentlemen. There are two more days, so... For all you mining nerds out there, you have found your conference. So try and sign up if you can. See if you can get in. And yeah, hope to see you there. So with that, you can find us online at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner. You can find us on Instagram at The Northern Miner. You can find us on YouTube where we host these podcasts. You can find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. And you can find us wherever podcasts are available, including Stitcher and Spotify. And with that, let's turn to our final Mining Minute with Gary Pox Leitner, Principal Mining Engineer with SRK Consulting. Welcome once again. Uh, we have Gary Pox Leitner here, who is from SRK Consulting. 
Welcome, Gary, to the show. It's been very interesting to hear you talk about cutoff grade and mine optimization. Tell me, what kind of issues do you often run into when you show up to a mine site? And what are people not thinking about that you bring to the table when you show up? Yeah, no, really good question, uh, Adrian. Within a mine, generally, everybody works in silos. Engineering is focusing on engineering and operations focusing on operations. Management focusing on management. And even though they try to find out what everybody's doing, it really is important. Like what we do is we go in and we look at the big picture. We speak to management, we speak to the operations, we talk to everybody and try to understand from a process point of view. You know, we talked about cutoff grade and mine optimization and mine economics, operating costs, all of these things are the challenges that keep operators awake at night. We're there to say, you know, what keeps you awake at night? And we're going to come in there and kind of mitigate those issues. And usually it's all around reducing operating costs, increasing production, increasing the safety and throughput at the mine, and really taking those things that keep them up out of the picture and, and working with them to do that. Tell me, is this an ongoing process or do you guys basically show up, you give some advice and, and that's it? Or is this something, or does it depend on the client? So usually with the client, uh, they often contact us directly and say, you know, we have this problem. Is this something we can help you out with? Or we might ask them, hey, you know, we're here to help. Um, you know, what's sort of keeping you up at night? What's What challenges do you have in your mind? Or do you want us to do an audit? We go to the mine, do a, a wide audit, take a look at their processes and take a look at their, their mine cost and productivity and see how we can help and improve those. I've worked in, in mining for 30 years. 20 years of those have been in mine operations. And it was working in operations that have really, I was often asked to help with the process and process improvement, fight fires, work with the teams to solve problems. And that's why I got into consulting. Fascinating. Yeah, it sounds like uh, very practical solutions are required. This isn't theoretical, right? This is operations and getting the best results. And, you know, you can write the nicest essay in the world, but that doesn't change anything. You have the rocks there that you got to figure out, right? Yeah, for example, uh, Adrian, um, you know, one mine, uh, they weren't using backfill for the longest time. They were just filling their, their stopes with waste rock so they couldn't extract the pillars next door. And because they couldn't tight fill, the, the stopes, the mine areas were caving in. And so they've invited us to go in and, and take a look and try to find a solution. And our solution is really to get backfill from one of their neighboring mines and, and tight fill all their existing properties and introduce a whole new backfill system to them. So that was one. And then they were able to extract parts of the deposits they weren't able to extract before because they didn't have backfill. And, and the result, of course, is process improvement, more tons and a lower operating cost, right? And a more safe, effective way to mine. Well, that sounds like a wonderful note to leave it on. Thank you once again for joining us. Gary Poxleitner, a fascinating journey into cutoff Great optimization and mine optimization and general consulting. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Adrian. And if you would like to learn more about uh, Gary's work and uh, what the services at SRK Consulting offers, simply visit them at srk.com. And also in the show notes, I will leave a link to Gary's LinkedIn profile, as well as a page on SRK Consulting dedicated to Gary Poxleitner with all of his services and expertise and general profile. So look for that. And now on to the news. And uh, here we go. So I'm going to open with the FT of all things, Financial Times, because I think a lot of these facts were in the last story when we discussed it, but I think what the FT did is they really highlighted a certain aspect of it. So I'm just going to get into it and then we can discuss. Rio Tinto in need of redemption after blasting Aboriginal site. Investors are querying destruction of 46,000-year-old sacred rock shelters in Western Australia. And this is by Jamie Smith uh, from the FT. This was done yesterday, so that would be June 15th. Rio Tinto Chief Executive Jean-Sébastien Jacques does not like miners being portrayed as environmental vandals telling investors in 2018 that comparisons made with the baddies in the movie Avatar made him, quote, mad. But efforts by the France-born executive to turn the image round have taken a battering in recent weeks after Rio blew up a 46,000-year-old Aboriginal heritage site to make way for an iron ore mine. The destruction of the sacred rock shelters in Pulbara, an area that generates two-thirds of Rio's earnings, key point, has turned the spotlight on the Anglo-Australian miners' corporate culture 
and highlighted the growing importance of environmental, social, and governance issues. And we hear protesters, culture above greed, uh, protester signs says, and indigenous groups and archaeologists are mad. But this is what I wanted to focus on. This couple of paragraphs further, Rio obtained the legal right to demolish the sacred sites in 2013 when it successfully applied to the Western Australian government for a Section 18 approval under the Aboriginal Heritage Act. The company had previously negotiated native title agreements with the Putu Kunti Kurama Pinikura people, giving it rights to mine the area. So then you get confused because then you think, oh, but in 2013, they were given permission to destroy the site. So what goes on? But then the following paragraph. But Rio's failure to abandon demolition when more than 7,000 significant artifacts were discovered during an archaeological dig in 2014 has sparked an international outcry. So according to the FT, they got permission in 2013, and they knew it was some kind of site, but then in 2014, they discovered 7,000 significant artifacts. So then all of a sudden they realized that this was more of a significant space than before. And then, nevertheless, Rio went ahead. And then we go to the apology, which we did see last week, and I should have been clued off, and maybe I was a touch, because I remember saying how I wasn't impressed with their apology. Quote, we are very sorry for the distress we have caused the PKKP, an Aboriginal group, in relation to Jukin Gorge, and our first priority remains rebuilding trust, he said on Friday. This is Mr. Jacques, the CEO of Rio Tinto. Now, I kind of picked up on this a little bit last week, but really uh, it should have been a bit of a clue. We are sorry for the distress we have caused. So they are not sorry for destroying the site. They are sorry that you're sad about it. Okay? So then they say that their first priority remains rebuilding trust. It seems to me that their first priority is money. Am I wrong? It seems to me their first priority. So this just seems like a bit of a falsehood. Our first priority remains rebuilding trust. It remains rebuilding trust. Uh, yeah, after you've destroyed the site. What I found shocking about this is that they knew what they were doing. And again, maybe I should that should have been obvious from the last story. But that little detail, I think, is very interesting. It's They had the legal runway from... 2013 to go ahead. Then 2014, all the archaeological evidence comes out that shows that this is a significant site, and they went ahead with it. This is the issue. And yeah, so there is an outcry and an uproar, and I think that is a very, very good thing. And you see the mixed messages that Rio Tinto is sending. They're putting a billion dollars into ESG, and then they're knowingly destroying archaeological sites in the name of money. I mean, this is classic 1980s-style corporate vandalism, okay? And so their whole message, they might as well throw a billion dollars in the river, right? Yeah, so that's Rio Tinto, and... I saw this other story from Reuters that it sounds like the Australian Senate is going to look into it. And BHP, that's our next story, is backing out. They were, had all these other Aboriginal sites from 15,000 years ago that they were going to run over and demolish. So uh, now something from just in Reuters here, and the story is called Rio Tinto Chief says, Sorry for sacred cave blasts. Australia starts inquiry. And Australia's Senate agreed on Thursday to begin a national inquiry into how the destruction of a cultural and historically significant site occurred. Under terms of the inquiry, the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia must report back by September 30th. In Australia, mining companies have to apply for a land use agreement with, quote, traditional owner groups, meaning indigenous communities, if it is, quote, unavoidable to develop a site without destroying uh, heritage site or an archaeological site, they have to apply to the government. So this whole 
Aboriginal Heritage Act is under review. I think it got slowed down by the coronavirus, and that also adds to the timing of this. Do they think, hey, we better blow this up while we can? So looks terrible. I really hope there's accountability because this is, you know, it, it's just, uh, it just makes you wonder. Moving on, BHP to revise mine expansion through 40 sacred sites. This is by Cecilia Jamazmi, mining.com. BHP will place on hold part of its expansion plans for its south flank iron ore project in Western Australia, which would have destroyed dozens of sacred Aboriginal sites. The move follows a national backlash over Rio Tinto's blasting of a 46,000-year-old Indigenous site last month in the resource-rich Pilbara region. Western Australia's Aboriginal Affairs Minister Ben Wyatt said in a statement he had approved BHP's application to, quote, impact the sites in the iron ore-rich area where BHP is planning the $3.4 billion mine expansion. The opinion of traditional owners, however, is not fully considered as they are not able to object to ministerial decisions made under Section 18 of the state's Aboriginal Heritage Act. Such resolutions are based on, quote, land users' conclusion that impact to a site is unavoidable, end quote. Traditional landowners are also unable to raise concerns publicly about the expansion, having signed comprehensive agreements with BHP as part of a native title settlement. The mining giant agreed to financial and other benefits for the Banjima people, while the native title holders made commitments to support the South Flank project. The legal loophole allows mining companies to apply for an exemption to damage or destroy cultural sites. So Aboriginal Affairs Minister Ben Wyatt said, quote, no objections were filed and I approved the notice on the 29th of May, 2020, this notice covers 40 Aboriginal sites. While the Banjima alleges they told the Western Australia government in April they did not want any of the 86 archaeological sites within the project area to be damaged. In their communication, they noted that the, quote, impending harm, end quote, to the area would be, quote, a further significant cumulative loss to the cultural values of the Banjima people. In an email from BHP spokeswoman, the company said on Thursday it was putting plans on ice. We will not disturb the sites identified without further extensive consultation with the Banjima people, the statement said. Yeah, these guys, I think, really need to start contributing to archaeological uh, museums and sites and just to the whole archaeological, for lack of a better word, industry if they're going to start mowing over these sites like this, and Rio Tinto in particular. So... The S in ESG is really on red alert here in Australia. A very contentious issue. I think it's an emotional issue for a lot of people because this is these are unreplaceable and there always has to be a balance. Like we were talking about the subway in Rome. At a certain point, you do have to do some things, but I mean, every site needs to be looked at and judged for what it is, and frankly, a 46,000-year-old site where they found 7,000 artifacts, you don't just blow that up. So, not to let the first story bleed into the second, so that is the latest in Australia. Mining, really a hot issue right there. And continuing on, so remember the Guiana Goldfields bidding war, and first it was Silver Corp that wanted to buy Guiana Goldfields, then... Grand Columbia Gold wanted uh, made a proposal, and it included a little bit of merging with two companies. It was a little complicated, but they offered a sweeter deal. Mysteriously, Guiana Goldfields rejected that. And then there was talk of an unnamed multinational miner that had made a bid, and Silver Corp backed off. And don't forget, Silver Corp is... Silver Corp's a weird company in the way that I can't tell if it doesn't seem state owned, but it does have, they work in China for mines. I mean, that's the extent of my knowledge of what Silver Corp's relationship with the government is there. So the mystery buyer turns out to be Zijin Mining. And so that is state owned. So another mine taken over by the Chinese government and yeah, I mean, like if we go back to our Porgera story where 
Barrick and PNG. And Barrick and Zijin own the Porgera mine. It's a joint venture. And PNG was threatening to not renew the mining license. They still are. And don't forget the Chinese government's response, which is uh, basically very threatening towards PNG. And they basically threatened very bad relations, right? So I think it's important for these countries to understand when you're bringing a Chinese state-owned mining company into your country and letting them buy assets, as I think we just sold TMAC in Canada, you don't have the same sort of, this isn't like a classic public company simply taking over an asset and you're simply subject to the laws of the land there. If you start redoing the laws in your own country, for whatever reason, you're going to have to deal with the, a superpower that's not going to be happy about you doing that sort of thing. It's not the same. As we were saying in the Pergara episode with PNG, it's not like the Canadian government started threatening PNG uh, once they took over, once they said they wouldn't renew Barrick's mining license. But we did see that from the Chinese government through various means. But the messaging came out. So Zijin is the unnamed multinational miner. So the drip, drip, drip continues of the Chinese government continuing to buy up all the assets around the world. So that's the perception from over here. Uh, it's, it seems nonstop. So anyways, so that is that. I'll let you read the story for yourself on northernminer.com. And continuing on, we got a commentary from First Cobalt CEO and President Trent Mell, and he talked about Black Lives Matter. And uh, he, I was reading uh, Trish Saywell's editorial. It just came out on the website a couple of days ago, and she had said how Trent had emailed her wondering what he could do about this because he felt quite strongly about the issue. And Trish suggested he write an editorial. So he did. And here it is, commentary, it's time for the mining industry to speak out on George Floyd. Trent Mell, president and CEO of First Cobalt. George Floyd has galvanized the world in a manner that countless other race-related murders have not. It is a moment to be seized, and First Cobalt has lent its voice to change on Twitter. And we have a First Cobalt tweet that says, No one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. If they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. That's by Nelson Mandela. And another tweet from Trent Mell himself. Racism is not a, quote, American issue. We must unite against hate as it is not enough to be anti-racist. You and I will be judged by our words and our actions. So Trent Mell feels very strongly, and I think a lot of people do, about this issue. And so he continues his essay. It is important for all of us to participate in the global dialogue that was provoked by the death of George Floyd. Racism is not only a problem in America, and we all have a role to play if we want to strive for a better future. In the U.S., Goldman Sachs, Peloton, BlackRock, Nike, and Microsoft are some of the companies that have taken a stand. In Canada, Manulife, Bank of Montreal, CIBC, Shopify, and Lululemon have issued statements or made financial pledges. I am disappointed that we have not seen any public statements from our larger Canadian mining companies. And then he talks about the chief of police in Toronto and talking about systemic racism in Canada. And I can't read the whole thing here, but I'm going to get to the mining industry part again. Uh, the mining industry has made some strides on the issue of diversity. The focus at the corporate level has been on the advancement of women through executive ranks and around the boardroom table. At the operational level, the emphasis is on creating meaningful opportunities for Indigenous communities where we operate. In order to increase cultural diversity within our ranks, Canadian demographics imply that a concerted effort must be made at the corporate office level. This is a frontier that requires more attention. And finally, my wife, a Korean immigrant, faced her own challenges with racism growing up in Canada, but never to the point of being afraid of the police. The video of George Floyd's death at the hands of law enforcement is so disturbing, and yet the bigger tragedy is the fact that we have seen this too many times before. This time, people rose up and said, enough is enough, black lives matter. 
So Trent Mell is going public and he is letting everyone know what he thinks and what he thinks the mining industry should do, which is to speak out more. So a bold and brave commentary from Trent Mell. So that, if you want to see it, is on northernminer.com. It's time for the mining industry to speak out on George Floyd. And finally, we have a story on the copper price to enter our metal section. This is by Carl A. Williams, senior reporter. Uh, copper prices have surged to their highest level in nearly three months on June 11th, reaching $5,801.50 per ton, or $2.63 per pound, on the LME, the London Metals Exchange, up almost 20% from a low of $4,854 per ton, or $2.20 per pound on March 5th, when commodity markets started to freefall due to the COVID-19 pandemic. A ramping up of demand from China, the top consumer of the red metal, is now fueling price increases after the country eased lockdowns and tra travel restrictions that were imposed to combat the outbreak. And the Chinese economy has been a central factor in the improving prices of recent weeks. However, price movements will depend on how much China's domestic demand can hold up as it waits for the export market to return. And we have a quote from Eleni Ioannidis, principal analyst at Wood Mackenzie, who told the Northern Miner in an email, quote, Chinese plants have been exposed to the export market through their downstream consumers and were impacted to a much greater extent than those who mainly serve the domestic market. So the exporters were hurt a lot more than the people that sold to the domestic market. And if we scroll down a bit, fiscal stimulus packages from global central banks, particularly the U.S. Federal Reserve and the People's Bank of China, are also fueling demand for copper. Prices are benefiting from the stimulus packages. Natalie Scott Gray is senior metals analyst with INTL FC Stone in London, who said that these stimulus packages may not be enough to support prices. And we have a quote from an email to the Northern Miner. Short term, we have already seen a huge rally in copper prices, but I believe this price to be massively overinflated, and I expect we will see copper prices turn downwards in the next quarter quite substantially. But I do not think we will see a lower low this year, though. So maybe that check mark or square root recovery from Scott Gray. In the longer term, however, Scott Gray believes that although the outlook for copper markets is bullish, the demand for copper from the rest of the world is unlikely to return to 2019 levels for years to come, restricting prices. We have another quote. While the Chinese stimulus package at 6.1% of GDP will help to raise GDP growth in the country, it was far less than expected. A sense of disappointment was felt in the metals market, which also stems from less direct spending on traditional infrastructure, metal-heavy projects. And we have a little bit on EVs here, also from Scott Gray. Quote, although the long-term electrification is going to be massively bullish for copper, this year the EV market was hurt significantly, COVID-19 aside. Overall, moves from China last July to cut subsidies resulted in a 10-month consecutive decline in NEV sales. Yeah, a very in-depth article on the copper price from Carl A. Williams. There's a lot more there. I just wanted to sort of give you a taste. Thank you, Carl. And with that, let's turn to metal prices. Prices. We'd like to thank Infomine.com for providing us with these prices each and every week. And if you'd like to find them online, just put in Infomine and metal prices into Google, and these prices will appear. And on June 16th, gold is trading at $1,729.13. That is $20 higher. In last week's quote, silver is trading at $17.42 per ounce. That is 23 cents lower than last week's quote. Platinum is trading $10 lower at $821.25. Palladium is trading $20 lower at $1,958.44 per ounce. And on June 12th, Copper is trading 11 cents higher at $2.62 per pound. Aluminum is a penny higher at 71 cents per pound. 
Lead is unchanged at 79 cents. Nickel is at $5.78 per pound. That is two cents lower than last week's quote. Tin is 35 cents higher at $7.80. And it's actually on quite a tear from the, gosh, in the last, it went from 656, 651, all the way to 780. It's been sort of climbing almost each week with a couple of little pauses. So tin, one to watch out for. So tin is trading higher at $7.80 per pound. Cobalt is unchanged at $13.38 per pound. And zinc is down two cents at 90 cents per pound. So my take on this is everything's in wait and see mode right now. We had that big drop in the market, I believe it was on Friday, a big 2000 point drop. And I think everybody's just on pause here. Industrial metals are slightly higher, but uh, yeah, overall things are in wait and see mode, as they say. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have the beginning of the Canadian Mining Symposium. And yeah, I thought we would just sort of get uh, Northern Miner Group Publisher Anthony Vaccaro's welcoming remarks. And also TMX's Dean McPherson, who is head of business development. He also has opening remarks. Uh, We just sort of kicked that off. Canadian Mining Symposium is on. This was recorded only two hours ago. So we are really doing a quick turnover here. So if you listen to this tonight, this will only be a few hours old. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Dean's a really interesting guy. And he really talks about the benefits and just the process of listing on the TMX group, which is the, the Toronto Stock Exchange and the TSX Venture Exchange, and which, as we all know, are very popular in the mining sector and globally. So I hope you enjoy it, and we will see you on the other side. I would like to introduce you to your host of the Mining Symposium. As group publisher of the Northern Miner Group, Anthony Vaccaro has overall responsibility for some of the mining industry's most distinguished media brands, including the Northern Miner, Canadian Mining Journal, and Mines Handbook. Mr. Vaccaro also serves as head of global mining for Glacier's Resource Innovation Group, where he oversees such noted brands as Mining.com, EduMine, CareerMine, and in Mining Intelligence. Mr. Vaccaro holds the CFA designation, has an MBA in investment management, and serves on the boards of the Resource Innovation Group, the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, and Women Who Rock. I will now turn this symposium over to your host, Anthony Vaccaro. So cheers to everyone. Again, thank you very much for joining us. Enjoy, uh, well, enjoying the show, I hope, but joining us for the time being. I think we have a very exciting, informative can't miss really three days that are just going to give you a very comprehensive view of where the mining industry sits at this unparalleled time. And on that note of being unparalleled times, we are part of the world and we are all, we're coming to you at a time, at a landmark time in our collective journey. And by collective, I'm of course referring to our global human experience. This industry has presented many of us with a unique opportunity to travel the globe, and work with people of all different religions, backgrounds, and races. It's very difficult to travel the world and at the same time hold a racist viewpoint. I can't ever remember meeting anyone in our industry or even outside of it who spent any amount of real time interacting with the diversity of people around the globe while at the same time thinking that one race was better or more deserving than another. I think there's a simple reason for that. To hold such a view of the world, you would have to be utterly unworldly or utterly stupid, or maybe both. Racism is quite simply an error, an error that needs to be eradicated. But while its diagnosis is simple enough, its consequences can be devastating and deadly. George Floyd is sadly only one example. Now it's an example that's so horrific that it's galvanized a massive amount of the world's population and that massive individuals are currently doing their best to steer our collective journey to hopefully a permanently more equitable and compassionate place. But how do we make these necessary changes real? How do we make them last beyond the peaceful protest? I won't pretend to have the answers and no one individual should pretend to. It's a collective path that we have to chart 
And the first group of people we need to listen to are those that have been subjected to the pains of a backwards mode of thinking. There are a number of ways to do that, whether it be listening to people in your own social network or actively seeking out the great of sound opinions on the matter that are already on the record. From there, a collective path is best charted when we all use our voices to convey our own shortcomings and our own experiences. For my humble part, I'd like to add this to the conversation. This venerated brand in our industry, the Northern Miner itself, does not have a sparkling history on this subject. I've gone through old editions, we're talking going back 80, 90, 100 years. That distance in time doesn't excuse the fact that there were comments and stories that fed in to a racist view of the world, either subtly or overtly. So as the current publisher of the brand, I'm offering the sincerest regret for the publishing of uh, any harmful or unacceptable words in the past. Our current team is committed to both hiring a diverse workforce and promoting through our media outlets the greatest diversity of well-thought-out opinions. As we strive to do this each day a little bit better than the last, we hope to in some small way contribute to the positive collective change that we currently all have the opportunity to be a part of. And now I'd like to introduce one of the first to get behind the idea, our sponsor, the DMX Group. Dean McPherson is going to join us. Dean is the head of global mining for the TMX Group. He's responsible for the development and execution of the global strategy for attracting new listings in the mining sector as the Toronto Stock Exchange and the TSX Venture Exchange. Dean brings a wealth of experience to his current role as prior to taking his post at TMX Group, Dean worked as an investment banker. Before joining capital markets, he worked as a civil engineer managing capital projects for Alcoa's bauxite and alumina operations in Jamaica and for Fleur in Canada. Dean, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. So thanks, Anthony, and uh, for that kind introduction and congratulations on, uh, on uh, pushing ahead and, uh, and adjusting quickly and getting this uh, conference off. Uh, it's been running for about five years or so now in London. And so it's great to see uh, this is yet another example of the flexibility and uh, resilience of our markets really in, uh, in pivoting and, uh, and, and getting, keeping things moving along. And certainly we've seen the market in general has, uh, has responded well to this, uh, cha this unprecedented challenge that, uh, that we've faced since the start of the year and particularly in March when things accelerated. The TSX uh, is at the center of the Canadian capital markets and by extension, the global capital markets. The Economic Intelligence Unit and the Global Affairs Canada put together some stats and just to show where we stand globally against our uh, other nations, other, other markets. And, you know, number one in a G20 for doing business in the next four years. And of course, the sound, one of the soundest banking systems globally and uh, makes uh, our our nation uh, certainly a very strong foundation to, to establish your, your company. So <laughs> drilling down into Canada itself, one of the uh, things that we've done over the years here has created a pragmatic security regime that supports companies as they grow. And uh, one of, uh, I just want to point to the first slide here about the Benin, the benign capital class action lawsuit environment we have here, and particularly when you consider uh, the US markets, uh, that's quite attractive to many issuers. Uh, just uh, just a bit of protection and it's something you know we we, we create we foster an environment here that supports growth and and not um, all of the other challenges or unnecessary noise that can enter a market when you have a, a class action environment that is uh, shall we say aggressive proximity and time zone uh, to one of the largest capital markets uh, of course in the world in terms of institutional uh, capital that's available to look at your and retail capital that's available to look at your your projects uh, we offer that here in canada uh, as well as some additional uh, structures that we find uh, to be quite attractive and efficient in this market and allows you the bot deal structure for instance i want to point it to here uh, certainly provides speed and uh, reduce risk for, for issuers or companies who are looking to raise capital quickly in mining. As we know, we've seen increased volatility over the past couple of years and certainly being in a market like this which, with uh, structures like the bot, bot deal structure that we have, which allows you to quickly act in the, in the windows that, uh, that might open up and close as, just as quickly sometimes. You know, this is the nature of a volatile uh, cap, global capital markets. 
Uh, we've seen recently uh, a, a certain, well, an opening of the market, of the, of the said window. You know, we've seen increased activity in the market over the past uh, three months, actually. And, and I think the bot deal structure that we have here has enabled a lot of our issuers. And certainly if you're a prospective issuer considering listing with us, this is uh, should be one of the, the attractions because it does allow you to quickly tap into that market and uh, and reduce risk and close those deals very quickly. Get the financing to, to, to explore and, and develop your projects. And of course, the other Canadian advantage is that you're entering a capital market on the TSX and the TSX venture that is certainly the leaders in, in, in the mining sector. So where does the TSX and the TSX venture rank uh, as, a glo- as a general global uh, marketplace, a stock market? Over the five, past five years, we have raised uh, over $254 billion, uh, in equity. This is across the board, not only mining. And certainly last year, we raised uh, $39 billion, uh, in equity capital for our issuers. And you see, uh, for a small nation of uh, close to 30 million, we, we, we punch certainly above our weight here with uh, the U.S., of course, being the largest um, market, followed by the Chinese exchanges. We're third. And so uh, Britain and, uh, and Australia are fourth and fifth. So you're entering a, a global market here in Canada. We are located in Canada, as I pointed out at the start, and uh, we are, we're only located in Canada, we we stretch quite far. Uh, you'll see 25% of our member firms for the TSX TSX venture are are headquartered outside of Canada, and 40% of our daily trading originates from outside Canada. So, you are entering a market that's uh, grounded in Canada, stable uh, financial market, but uh, it's a global market at the same time. And and you'll find global investors and global participants reach out to our market, particularly in the mining sector, when they're looking for opportunities. These are some of the institutional uh, investors, and uh, we're talking. We're our estimation, along with uh, some the sources at the bottom there, uh, money manager advisors, uh, manage money advisor services, etc. Estimate that we're looking at the institutional market of about five trillion Canadian dollars. The estimation is that this institutional market ex- that extends beyond Canadian border. This is only in Canada, mind you. When you consider beyond Canada in the U.S., for instance, you're talking about five times that that estimation. So we're looking at about 30 million, 30 trillion, sorry, institutional uh, money that's uh, in Canada, which is again I pointed out earlier the importance of having uh, access to that money in uh, in a time zone that is uh, that is similar to theirs and and um, and proximity, of course, is important. So, which is again another reason to consider our market. Uh, this just points to the global nature of our liquidity. Again, uh, uh, just uh, say that 33 uh, percent of our TSX trades in large cap involve liquidity provided by global market makers. Again, just you know, I can't stretch enough, stress enough the importance of the global nature of our marketplace these days. And as we see, uh, it's more important than ever. So the TSX, uh, uh, just to tie up the TSX and the TSX venture. We have a unique system here. This, this slide points to the number of issuers that we have on our system. Just to give you an idea of the scale, we're talking about over 3,200 issuers. And last year we did 273 going public events. And as I mentioned earlier, raised close to 40 billion for in equity capital for companies listed on us. And this is again across the board. An interesting thing to point out here is that we do have a dual uh, marketplace. Uh, we have a TSX venture where the average financing hovers around 2.7 uh, million and that goes up. That you know That's an average. You'll find that the majority of our issuers are listed on the venture exchange and the venture exchange has been an, a, a great uh, opportunity and perhaps is the most active venture exchange, junior exchange that you'll find globally for mining companies. And uh, it, though the average is 2.7 million, you'll find that the financings on the venture can be as high as 500 million. So uh, that's interesting to note, and uh, you know uh, the graduation process from the junior market up to the senior market is quite aggressive. We've had a, close to 700 companies since we uh, we started this uh, the, the tracking the numbers, uh, which is about 20 years ago. Uh, we've had about 700 mining 700 companies graduated up to the big board, and some of the largest mining companies that you may know actually started out uh, on the venture exchange. Uh, the TSX uh, mar- uh, average financing is close to, to 70 million. So digging into the mining sector in particular now, as I mentioned at the start, you were entering a marketplace that is the leader in, in the mining sector. Uh, we're number one uh, globally for mining. I mentioned 
uh, we have about 3,200 overall uh, issuers listed across all sectors on our marketplace. For mining, uh, we have 1,138,000 uh, uh, mining companies listed on both the TSX and the TSX Venture, and, and this is at the end of last year, at the end of uh, 2019. We are number one for listed mining companies naturally globally, and our nearest competitor is close to half of what we the number of companies we have listed. So you're entering a market that knows mining that uh, is uh, it's half of our business is mining. We're close to half of it anyway. We're uh, we're it's an important sector for us, and it, and and it shows. And you'll see later on in the week when we talk about some of the things that we're doing to help our issuers on Thursday in particular around ESG, which is a big issue, and I think we'll continue to be a big issue even more so than ever. You know, naturally, we have more mining companies than anyone globally. We also are our number one in equity capital raise over the past five years. Uh, Thirty-seven of every thirty-seven cents of every dollar raised was was through our marketplace, and it only follows by the fact that we have more, almost twice the number of uh, mining companies listed with us than our nearest competitor. Uh, digging into the diversity of our marketplace, which is always a question that that uh, that comes up, you know, uh, in terms of if you have a property in in Asia, Australia, it doesn't matter where your property is. Looking at the right hand side of this slide, you'll see uh, 47 percent of the properties that are represented on our market. And these are properties held by issuers that list with us. Uh, only only 45 percent of those properties are in Canada. You know. Uh, gold is is a strong is close to 35 percent of in terms of primary commodities being produced or explored or developed on our marketplace of you know th on those properties that are on the right hand side gold represents the largest percentage as you can imagine and so they you know i think gold is um those issuers are enjoying up quite a bit of run right now and we'll talk about that later in the week i'm sure uh, copper is, of course, you know, the importance of copper. We all know that if you're in the sector. Just a graphic uh, representation here of the spread of our, our properties. And I talked already about, uh, you know, how, how, how uh, diverse globally we are in terms of where we are represented and where we do business and where we will we will accommodate uh, uh, issuers with properties globally. So we're not a marketplace like some others that, you know, our investors, North American investors tend to look for opportunities where they are and assess and investors in our marketplace are quite adept at evaluating risk and opportunities globally. And, and you know, uh, things happen there, uh, the global risk often shifts and the ability to turn an ecosystem that can provide analysts and banking support to help evaluate and translate those, those events and challenges and threats uh, is, is quite important. And, and uh, I think a large part of that shows in, in just how far spread our issuers are globally. So how do you enter our marketplace? There are a couple of options and we're quite a flexible uh, market to enter. We, we tailor uh, opportunities to, to enter uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange or the TSX Venture Exchange. Uh, and, you know, there's a traditional IPO path, but we also have, I just want to highlight here, CPC program, our capital pool company program. And what CPCs are, we have listed companies that are only shell companies. And this is across all sectors. But for the mining sector, we have also CPCs that are listed and trading, and they're available on our website. And certainly you can contact me and I'll give you a list of those available who are interested in mining properties. And they will they are listed solely to see what we call a QTA, but it really it's a RTO with a property. So those shell companies that are trading will do a reverse takeover or merger with uh, with a property and this is quite an efficient means of uh, of going public on our marketplace it lowers costs in many cases and uh, and often it i think the biggest opportunity is that it will provide you with uh, with stakeholders or uh, partners who are quite adept at the north american capital market and uh, it, it, as I said, it's quite efficient, cost and time efficient. And uh, you enter the TSX venture through this method and you, uh, in, a, in two years, you, you're graduating to the TSX, the big board. So of course the dual, dual listing is another uh, method of, list of joining our marketplace. If you're listing on another exchange already, there's the opportunity to do a dual listing or interlisting with us. And that's it. Uh, that's an introduction to our marketplace. You have seen us, seen us if you're already a client, it's uh, great that you're here and, and it's going to be a great week to discuss what's happening in our marketplace. There is a lot to discuss and, uh, and I look forward to, uh, to chatting with you some more this week. Thanks, Laura.
drinks with Dean. That was probably the highlight. Well, I don't know if it was the highlight of last year's CMS, but it was one of the highlights for sure. Last year's Canadian Mining Symposium in London, having drinks with Dean. That was fun. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the show. We have three days going here, so... If you're listening to this tonight, again, you'll have two more days. You can still go to the Northern Miner website. I believe you can still register. Uh, Just go to the banner at the top of the page. Until next week, take care.